When malware runs on a computer, it always has a goal in mind. It has a purpose to carry out these actions on objectives. Whether it's to move laterally throughout the network, or escalate privileges to become an admin user, or just get a callback so the hacker can maintain access or install persistence. But defensive security tools get in the way. Things like antivirus or EDR, endpoint detection and response. Think of sandboxes or tools that can analyze the malware's behavior so the computer can determine if this program is good or malicious software. But you know, a lot of malware can bypass these defenses or circumvent it or get around it and hide under the radar. So it begs the question, how does malware know when it's being monitored? In this video, I wanna show you some anti-debugging techniques. So malware can know and determine, am I under the microscope? Am I attached to a debugger? Or is something analyzing me so it can just bail out and not fire the payload to run the actual malware? So I am inside of my Windows 11 virtual machine, and first things first, I'm going to get started with some code. In this video, we're gonna use C, the C and C++ programming language, to write our malware. So I'm gonna get Visual Studio started, and then we'll slap together just a simple proof of concept for getting a callback, reverse shell, and having access to this target or victim machine. We'll create a new project. I'll just use a C++ project, and I'll call it anti-debug, and then we can go ahead and click create down in the bottom right. Okay, Visual Studio is good to go, so let's add a source file for our main.cpp. Now I am just going to paste in some of the code for a classic vanilla flat and cookie cutter shell code injector, right? Uh, we've showcased this in a previous video that was in the NIM language, in this case we're in C, but we're doing the same stuff, just interacting with Win32 API functions, using virtual alloc to allocate some memory for our shell code, copying in the memory for our shell code, putting it in that buffer there, and creating a thread to execute it, and then virtual free wait for single object close handle to let it run and then clean stuff up. If you haven't seen that video, you should totally check it out. I'll add a link in the description, but now we need to add in our shell code. So I'm going to break out of this Windows virtual machine and I'm gonna get over to our Kali Linux attacker side, acting as the adversary, and I'll open up a terminal and I'm going to fire up Sliver. Now, Sliver is one of those command and control frameworks, a lot like sort of a remote access Trojan or a tool just to be able to still interact with, whether it's a beacon or a session or some sort of interactivity on the target. We've also covered Sliver in a previous video, so I'll link that in the description, but I'm just going to cruise through setting up a listener and getting a handler set in stage for us. We'll use MTLS as our listener, and I do just want to grab my IP address so we can see, okay, we are going to be calling back to 192.168.111.166 here. So let's use Sliver to create a profile for that with MTLS as the handler. Now we know that our MTLS is listening on quad eight and our profile is set up. Now let's create our stager listener that we can just go ahead and build out with the profile that we've used on HTTP with the scheme for our IP address. Now we'll know that that HTTP handler is listening and ready for us so we can go ahead and generate the stager at that same IP address in port and spit it up. Okay, that has created our inquisitive hail shellcode and the plant that we want to end up using. So let me open up another terminal and let's go ahead and work with that. If we actually take a look at our inquisitive hail shell code, it is of course just nonsense. It's all the bytes and binary data for the file. We want to convert that into usable shell code, but you can see how it is going to our handler for HTTP. So I am just going to run one of my tools at bin nim so I can convert that. And I am going to use the nim format just because it's already in hex and it outputs nice and easy that we can just copy and paste into our shell code launcher program. We'll go ahead and slap that in, and the length of that shell code was, I think, 1175? Cool, yeah, and I think we are good. Now, hey, let me let you know, I do have Defender turned off. So regular default antivirus on this Windows machine is completely killed, disabled. There's another video on that I'll add in the description. And uh, it's just because this video is to showcase anti-debugging techniques, not anti-evading AV and EDR stuff. It's some of the, just debugger and that we're trying to avoid. So let's compile that. I'll use Control Shift B. Good, now we have the executable. Let me hop over to that directory, open up PowerShell in the terminal. Let me change directory over there and we have our anti-debug.exe. All right, now I'll put Kali on the left-hand side. I'll put Windows on the right. I'll fire up my anti-debug executable and now we have a new session opened up. We could go ahead and use that session. I'll tab to autocomplete and here we are. We can see that we are in that target under the Windows 11 John user. We can check out the current directory. We can go ahead and see what's inside of it. We have control over this 
this machine. Now we've got some functioning malware, even though simple and trivial and trite, but here's the kicker. What if a blue teamer, a defender, a security researcher, someone trying to do some analysis, maybe a SOC analyst, found this, stumbled upon it, and they wanted to analyze it? Say they opened up some of the tools from the sys internal suite. I don't know, maybe they got Procmon fired up, maybe they're checking if there are any child processes, or weird parent process spoofing, like with Process Explorer, and we've covered that in a previous video, right? I'll have another link for that in the description. Or what if they were going to fire up a debugger, something they could actually see the instructions as they're executed as this program runs. Maybe like x64 debug or windybug, like windy bag I like to say. We could fire up windybug preview, and if you aren't familiar with the debugger, it's exactly that. It's just a tool and program that allows you to take a look at other programs and see what they're doing, what's happening in memory, what's going on in like the processor instructions, what are the registers, the stack, the heap, all those things look like. We could open it up and see everything that it might just import or use or do. Here, take a look. We might be able to see some local symbols if they're accessible, threads that are running, assembly instructions or whatever, modules that are loaded in. But that is one example of the microscope that our malware wants to get out from under. You know, sandboxes and analysis tools and all these engines like AV and stuff that you can find on VirusTotal. Our malware wants to stay undetected. So it wants to behave or just do nothing nefarious if it knows some of those analysis tools or a debugger is in action. So let's modify our code back in Visual Studio. We can collapse and close out some of the shell code here and let's get back into our main function and let's just determine if a debugger is present. If we know that we're attached to a debugger, then just bail out. Don't do anything. Don't detonate or fire off our payload to get the reverse shell going. Let's just check if, and this is super duper easy here, this is one of the best and easiest ways to do this, is debugger present? It's literally that easy. One of those functions will allow us to determine, hey, if a debugger is actually there, then we can just go ahead and actually, I don't know, maybe display for our sake under the microscope and then just return zero. So our program does not fire and get the reverse shell callback. Now testing this is really easy. Even inside of Visual Studio, we can just press F5 on our keyboard. It'll compile and run. And since it's gonna end up running with Visual Studio's debugger, it'll just say, Oh, we're under the microscope and it's not gonna do anything. We won't get our callback. Say I hop back to Kali Linux for just a second and I check out our sessions. Sad face, we currently have no active sessions. And I did kill the other one, so that way I was able to actually compile and you know work with the binary again. Even if we were to go open up Windybag, our favorite debugger here, Windybag Preview, uh, if I were to open up that executable again, it won't work. It'll be clicked launch executable. Let's get our anti-debug running. We'll let the thing go after I enter G, but it's done. It will terminate the process process nice and easy. Here the instructions have brought that all the way down and it is the end of the application. We just bailed out. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, John, that's dumb. It's super duper easy. It's like, it's just that single function. That function's probably gonna be pretty easily signatured and like actually tracked down by sandboxes, antivirus, AV engine, whatever. And you're totally right. So much so, this is a little bit, I think, funny. Uh, I actually just put together some simple code that literally just runs only that function call to check if there's a debugger and nothing else. Slap that into virus total, and there are like eight engines that are like, that's bad. <laughs> I think that's hysterical. The code like doesn't do literally anything else. My point is that is a pretty suspicious function to call, even if it's like well tucked away within Win32 API calls. And it can even be bypassed. Some debuggers, I think like x64 debug has Scylla or Scylahide that is like an anti-anti-debugging technique. So we could try some other techniques. And of course, we've seen this in plenty of other malware samples that we've explored on this channel. What you could do is use like a deny list and say, hey, here's our list of processes, things that if are they are running in the current environment, then bail out, do nothing, don't actually detonate and fire the payload. You could say, look, if x64 debugger's running, or IDA, or Procmon, or Process Explorer, just as we used before, or like the Visual Studio Code debugger or anything, then bail out. The tough part with that technique though is that you really have to think up as many different debugger names as possible or however many security research or analysis tools there could be so you are at least covering all your bases. And even then those string names like the actual names of the executables that you're trying to hunt for they probably should be obfuscated or encrypted in some way so they're hidden in mass because otherwise they're just present in the binary and could be another indicator. This code sample here uses the create tool help 32 snapshot one of those functions that's actually 
actually used as a good technique to help iterate or enumerate through processes running in the environment. And you can just check, hey, if it's one of those bad deny listed applications, then okay, a debugger or some security analysis tools are in place, bail out and don't do anything. But because that technique also has its issues, we can totally try another technique. There are a whole lot of these. And if you like this stuff, if you're loving it and you're having fun with all this malware development and you want to learn more of these techniques, hey, I'd love to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, which is where I'm getting all these ideas and resources. I'll let them take it away. Maldev Academy. Brought to you by the renowned security researchers Mr. Docs and Null, join a comprehensive and module-based malware development course that provides fundamental to advanced level training. Write your own implants, beacons, and malware with modern 64-bit architecture. Perfect for offensive security specialists or even beginners with no prior experience in malware development. With over 100 text-based modules, all with downloadable files and code, and a vibrant Discord community, you learn so much. Between process injection, compile time API hashing, anti-debugging techniques, sandbox detection, and so, so much more. You're provided a virtual machine that includes all the pre-built tools and code ready for you. And of course, upon completion, you get that fancy certificate that proves all the awesome stuff that you've learned. With Maldev Academy, you can choose any plan for access to the material, or jump into lifetime access and get all the new updates. Both Mr. Docs and Null are always sharing new research, between low bins or other tradecraft, and with Maldev Academy, you can truly become a professional malware developer. Dive into the Academy with my link below in the video description, jh.live slash maldevacademy. For a limited time, you can use my code Hammond10 for 10% off. Huge thanks to Maldev Academy for sponsoring this video. So one more of the many different anti-debugging techniques that you can learn with Maldev Academy and getting into all this is actually trying to create our own custom is debugger present replacement. Like, hey, just trying to kind of create our own crafted rendition of that function that will still do the same thing, but isn't as easily going to be signatured or found within the binary. Maldev Academy actually suggests, and they try to remember, you know, one of the previous modules, they showcased the PEB or the process environment block, something present in every binary, they note that that PEB structure has a being debugged property that's actually going to be toggled when it's attached to a debugger. So we could just sort of hand jam, craft and create our own sort of replacement for the is debugger present function where we can just check that property. Now they've put together this function here for is debugger present too, but they're using some unique types, a structure that they've already created that allows them to actually access the PEB structure and all those members and properties. And that way they can read from it given the architecture architecture of the environment. The thing is, we need to track down how they actually built out that PEB structure. That structure that they use for the process environment block does have some undocumented properties and members, or undocumented at least according to Microsoft, you know, on their MSDN or Microsoft documentation site. But thankfully, other debuggers like x64 debug have already gone ahead and kind of documented and at least given all these header files for unique different libraries that we could use. So kudos, props, and credit all goes to x64 debug here. If you dig into their GitHub repository, you can actually track down the header file for ntdll. And we could go ahead and find if we do what, whatever type def struct underscore peb, uh, there's one, here we go. We can see it's got everything like our Boolean value as to whether or not it is actively being debugged. So let's go ahead and copy all the contents of this code and let's go slap it into our own sort of temporary on the side ntdll header file. So let's get back into Visual Studio. Let's go check out our solution explorer and let's add a new header file, my ntdll with a .h extension. We can go ahead and add that and I'll go ahead and paste in hippity hoppity, your code is now my property. Let's save this. Now let's get back to our main source code here and let's create a new function for the Boolean value called, I don't know, under the microscope. And let's check if defined win64 for the 64-bit architecture, we'll say the ppeb for the pointer to the peb. Given that type, we'll define a ppeb object and set that equal to casted peb pointer where we read gsq word. Yeah, that's the thing for 64-bit. And hex 60 is what we want there. Otherwise, we will go ahead and use an l if. If we're defined as win32, we'll do the same thing, but then go ahead and read 
30 bytes, so that's half of it. And if for our declaration, and since we are returning a Boolean value, we'll need to go ahead and check if the pointer to our peb actually has the being debugged property set to one. In that case, we'll go ahead and return true. Otherwise, we can just return false. And hey, let's not forget, we still have our red squiggly lines, Visual Studio trying to tell us that we're doing something wrong here. We do want to make sure we actually include our own myntdll.h. Remember that's in double quotes because it's local, not just one of the standard libraries or usual header files that are included here. With that, we can save and we're good. Let's go ahead and change our is debugger present to our under the microscope function here. And now let's test this. Let me go ahead and hit F5 to compile and run. Spinning it up, here we go. Okay, terminal is open and we are under the microscope because it's ran inside of the Visual Studio debugger. Of course, firing up in WinDebug, it'll give us the exact same functionality. We'll determine that we are being debugged and then we will just bail out. Let me launch the recent executable. It'll fire up, I'll hit G to go and then we're already dead. Now, the real moment of truth. I know I kind of neglected this for the first run, but if we actually bring this to the side, we know that we aren't going to run into debugger so we can see we can actually fire up our malware. Let me get back to Kali. Currently, we have no sessions, but if I fire up the terminal and go ahead and run my anti-debug, now that we are not in a debugger, we already got our session coming through and we are still hacking away, going to be able to use that session and actually get who am I, what directory am I in, maintain access with our malware. That is super cool. Now, hey, let me say, I have only scratched the surface of all the cool things you could dig into with Maldiv Academy and this anti-debugging techniques module. There's a whole nother rendition of how you could recreate that is debugger present method. There are a couple other syscalls or functions that you can use that will give you enough information to determine whether or not you're in a debugger. Some other cool techniques you could use specific to like the debuggers using hardware breakpoints or other tricks. They even have stuff that are like digging into the registers or knowing that, hey, because there's going to be a break, like when the debugger opens up and attaches to an executable, it ends up taking some time for you to actually enter G or go or let the program loose. When you release it from hang being held on by the debugger, because that takes time, you could check the delta and how long that's actually gonna take. If you know that takes longer than usual, you're clued in, there's a debugger in the environment. Tons of other cool tricks like checking out the performance counter, I don't know, digging into debug break or debug output, there's so much. I for one think this is really cool because I feel like it's a staple of like malware, like you know, like real genuine malware that's out there in the ether. Like we see all those when we've dug into even like small silly scripting samples on this channel. So hey, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something new. Hope you got to dig into more of those functions or get a little bit more research in. And if you're up for it, I hope you go take a look at Maldiv Academy. Link in the video description. They're one of my favorite sponsors to work with. Seriously, their stuff is so cool. Thanks for watching, everybody. YouTube algorithm stuff. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.